Hello, and welcome to our first first Friday event of the semester. Um, this is our now long running, I think we've been going long enough that we can call ourselves long running, uh, our philosophy in the city series, um, which is a series of philosophical events that are open to the community, right, with the goal of creating community dialogue around philosophical issues that impact the everyday. Um, so we're, uh, hello, this and series is welcome run to our oh, first, first Friday event of the oh, semester. No. Um, this is our now Ooh. long running. I think we've been going long enough. Uh, hello again. Sorry, we had uh, sort of technical difficulties right <laughs> off the bat, um, but that's okay. That happens. Sorry about that. We are now back live. Um, so as I was saying, right, uh, Philosophy in the City is run by the UCCS Philosophy Department um, and is meant to, meant to really foster community dialogue, right? Uh, and to make the point that there's philosophy everywhere. I think sometimes people have this idea about philosophy that it is sort of um, to call ahead to the to the discussion we're about to have, sort of a a thing on a hill, right? That only some people can engage in. Um, and this series is really meant to say, no, there are philosophical issues everywhere. Um, let's talk about them. Uh, so I am Dr. Jen Kling, Assistant Professor of Philosophy at UCCS, and I am your host this evening. Um, this evening's event is Religious Diversity: The Promise and the Warning. Um, and we have with us uh, Dr. Patrick De Silva, also of UCCS Philosophy, who's going to be our guest speaker tonight. Patrick, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so number one, thank you so much to uh, the organizers of the event, uh, especially our um, people behind the scenes, like Stephanie, who are working so hard to allow us to overcome you know, the, the distances involved. Um, yeah, so I've been a part of the department teaching mostly like world religions courses, as well as intro to philosophy, and then uh, one course on Islamic philosophy for the last few years. Um, my training is in uh, religious studies um, and specifically looking at mysticism in South Asia and the exchange of, do you want to get really technical, um, esoteric breathing practices uh, between uh, yogis and Sufis, sort of Muslim mystics. Um, but, you know, for this talk, I really wanted to look at this sort of question we have of um, how do we deal with, with diversity and given my training and, and sort of the focus of the series here, looking at it here in the U.S. and in terms of religion, um, if we have time, we can talk about how other countries deal with, with similar types of questions. But uh, my, my intention is to focus tonight um, on the United States. That will probably give us enough to deal with, <laughs> is <laughs> what I think. Probably. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you. So uh, I also want to give a warm welcome to our live audience. Hello, audience out there. Um, I know we're, oh, we are almost a year into this pandemic, which is a little bit wild, um, which means that all our events have been virtual for the past year. Um, we deeply miss you. We're really excited to get back into our in-person events. Um, but until we have that, um, we do hope that you will use the chat to submit any questions that you have um, to Dr. De Silva or myself. I mean, I don't, I don't know what I would say, but I'm happy to present your questions to Dr. De Silva. So if in the course of the discussion, um, there's anything you wanna know or you'd like him to elaborate on, Put your question into the live chat on YouTube and uh, it'll come directly to me and then we'll ask. So you sort of have the opportunity for live feedback. 
Um, so please do feel free to throw those questions in the chat. Um, so I think that's everything. Uh, so without further ado, let's, uh, let's talk religious diversity, the promise and the warning. Um, so Patrick, can you just start by explaining that title to us? That was the title you gave me. Tell me what it means. Yeah, so I, what, I'm, what I was thinking about in, in composing a title, um, other than just something that would, that would look good on a flyer, um, <laughs> is, is that when I think about this, what I, what I call the Project of America, um, that's been going now for some, you know, 400 roughly years, that um, there's this promise that I feel like I grew up hearing and a lot of other people internalized as well, that this was supposed to be a place for everyone. And yet, and everyone, you know, and we, in terms of tonight, we'll look at religion, but we'll touch on intersections with race and gender and sexuality and ability and, and all these other types of very important intersections. Um, but then, you know, I, what I think we're, a lot of people have been pointing to for a very long time, uh, and we'll just sort of do another version of that tonight, is the warning of what happens when you don't actually, um, you know, walk the walk. Um, we have this sort of promise, this idea dating back to, um, you know, John Winthrop's famous speech um, in 1630 to the Puritans as they were you know, about to settle what would become known as Boston, that this, you know, this colony was going to be a city on a hill, which, which in turn, you know, is a reference back to, to the Gospels um, from the New Testament. And so um, from the beginning, you know, for some people, that's the beginning of, of America. Uh, later on, I'll, I'll provide um, sort of a, perhaps a, a Howard Zinn-esque, um, if I could be so bold, sort of a revisionist, origin story. Um, but so there's this like, idea that, you know, we had these, in essence, refugees, right? They, religiously speaking, they were, they were people who were too extreme in their beliefs and their practices for 17th century, you know, England. Um, and so that's where many people look back and see kind of the American origin story that these people came and they established these colonies where you had free, the idea was to have this free exercise and free practice of, of religion. Um, and, you know, of course, every Thanksgiving, I think about how uh, indigenous nations, you know, not just in what we now call New England, but, you know, throughout the Americas have endured that, that process, which is something else we can, we can touch on for, for sure. Um, but this whole idea of a city on a hill, right, that this was going to be this sort of this exemplar, um, you know, indeed for, for the world. And, you know, that's a, a metaphor that, um, you know, very effective communicators like Ronald Reagan, um, you know, drew upon, right, during, during his administration. He said this was going to be a city on, on a hill. But this time, just in terms of instead of city, then talking about the nation. Um, and, if, you know, if we look then at the history of the early colonies, um, you know, we get Lord Baltimore founding the uh, colony of Maryland, or if you think of it as Maryland, then you can, you can guess that, you know, Lord Baltimore wanted to establish this colony where English Catholics could practice freely, right? So you have to think of, you know, Europe at this time, sort of 16, 1700s, it's, you know, this period of intense uh, conflict largely over, um, well, or at least framed largely in terms of religious identity um, and, you know, this is all this ongoing warfare between Catholic states and then Protestant states. Um, and, and so then there's this, I think, I think this is fair to say this part of this like sort of myth um, of America. And I don't use myth in any kind of denigrating term. You know, I, I teach mythology at a, a different institution. And on the first day I tell the students, you know, myths are these sacred truths with a capital T that we use to learn who we are, where we're from, how we came into the world, um, how we're supposed to relate to people around us. How do we define us? How do we define them? How do, you know, how do we <laughs> treat them? Um, and so I think built into this story of, of America, especially when we get into, you know, the once there's the war of independence, 
Um, then you start to see, you know, we have this, the, the first amendment, right. Is, and I'll, here I, I made sure to write it out. So, right. Congress <laughs> shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting free exercise thereof. And then of course, you know, the rest of the clause clauses are, you know, about freedom of the press and assembly and, and, and so forth. But so we get into this, I think, hotly contested and, and debated question of what is, okay, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, what does it mean to establish a, a religion? And what does it mean to prohibit free exercise? And at what point are the definitions we come up with strained, if not broken, by the ever-increasing diversity of the community? Um, yeah, I just wanted to like say it's it's so interesting listening to you talk about this idea of myth, right, and the idea of capital T truth. Because I was thinking when you pointed out that the Puritans were refugees, right? I had this thought, and tell me if I'm totally off track, but I thought one way to to bring that forward, right, is that like two of our most famous superheroes are an immigrant and a refugee, right? So famously, Superman is a refugee, and Wonder Woman is an immigrant, right? And I think it, it lines up with the, this idea of this mythos as America is, right, the nation of immigrants, right? It's the place that takes refugees, right, and allows them to practice their religion and their way of life freely. Is that, am I tracking? You are. And, and you know, um, I mean, I love, I love comic books, so it's worth pointing out that a lot of the writers of mm -hmm. these early comic books that became so popular in the early part of the 20th century moving forward, I mean, they were Jews from New York and they were living that, you know, immigrant experience. And this is why so many comics that become popular are about these characters that are outsiders in particular ways, you know? So yes, Superman has all these superpowers, but yeah, he's also, you know, amongst the last of his, of his kind, right. The survivor of this horrible, you know, war fleeing this strife. Yeah. Um, yeah, we could say, <laughs> we could say a lot more about, about comics and we can, um, and if we, if we even have more time, we can talk about Star Trek too, just to make Always. it even more exciting um but but yeah you know this is this is part of what i think is what and again i'll just you know this was my experience growing up was being taught this was this was america mm -hmm. right this was this celebration where people could come here um and as you know one recent president said you know the skinny kid with the funny name um could grow up and become president um you know my own father immigrated here from india in the late 60s along with my grandparents and my and my uncles and um you know their experience was certainly challenging but you know they were able to um you know be very 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 you know successful no matter how you define it um and you know i've often wondered how much of that was because even though they were coming from from india that they were catholic and mm -hmm. so when they immigrated from Bombay to, you know, Ames, Iowa in 1968, um, then, you know, getting established with the local church, um, I've always thought that that would be, that that would have been something that you know, made it maybe a little bit easier. Of course, you know, winters in Iowa compared to the, <laughs> compared to Bombay were, were quite different, but that was its own set of, you know, mm -hmm. that's a different type of climate challenge. Yeah. But so I take actually that's super interesting that they were from they were originally from India and Catholic right and I think that that ties into the the point you were starting to make before I interrupted you to talk about superheroes um, right which is this I think I I sometimes forget this right that different parts of the United States when they were colonized were colonized for particular different religious groups right and so does that do you see that sort of playing out like in American history, does that play forward to our current context at all? Do you think? I think it, I think it does, you know, um, so our, our nation, um, what a piece of work, uh, we, <laughs> we are a patchwork quilt of, of communities. Um, you know, I went to college in Minnesota and there's all kinds of, you know, of Scandinavians there, um, and that's a strong part of the local 
culture. Um, you know, if you're in the, the Northeast, you not only have the um, sort of descendants of, you know, the, the Puritans, but when we get later on into the 19th century, we have massive waves of immigration from Germany, Italy, and Ireland, kind of to all parts of the country, but we can certainly look at, you know, Italy and, and, and Ireland um, as having established, you know, huge immigrant communities, I mean, you know, in the late 1800s um, in, you know, different parts of the of the Northeast, you know, there, there's a reason that when the World Cup for soccer was held here in 1994, that they the organizers were, were smart. You know, Italy and Ireland were drawn together in the group stage, and they played that game. Um, I forget if it was. I think it, I think they played it in New York, which was really smart because they knew that um, you know there'd be all these people who were like, "Oh, it's you know these these rivalries from the so-called old world are you know coming with us." Um, and that's also part of this American story is everyone, you know, really, I mean, unless you're, you know, Dine or, or Navajo or, you know, you belong to a Native American, you know, nation, um, ultimately you are from somewhere else. You know, we don't often say this or we don't say it enough, but, you know, Christianity, which we know is a very dominant sort of cultural influence here in the U.S., but it's an immigrant religion and we don't often think of it that way we even you know my students you know oftentimes you can tell that um in most christian communities we're not we certainly aren't raised thinking that christianity is a middle eastern religion um you know maybe we think it's like european um but that's several centuries you know into the the ball game as they say right um, and, and so there's all these, I again, go back to the, the myth side of things, right? So we have these sacred narratives that we tell about, about who we are. Um, and if your story is that you're ultimately from somewhere else, that's very different from saying, oh, I'm from here. Mm. Um, and I think what we've seen is that what happens generation after generation is the longer you're here, the less you identify as being from somewhere else. Right, unless um, in unless that sort of dominant political, social, cultural paradigm continually tells you that you're not really from here. Yeah, that you're not you're not you're not a real American, right? Yeah. I yes. Just, it's that's it's so interesting because you were because when you speak to this idea of Christianity being a Middle Eastern religion, I remember this moment that was like very transformative for me in grad school, actually. I know we were just chatting about grad school earlier, and one of one of my professors said, "Oh yes, let's talk about the Christian diaspora," and I was like, "Christians don't have a diaspora, right? A, di a diaspora is something that has happened to other religions, but it has not happened to Christians, right?" And she was like, "No, no, there's a Christian diaspora, like all of us here," and I was like, "My brain is now broken, <laughs> like." And for the for the viewers at home, you 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 probably don't don't know, but um, so Jen, of course, you and I share, um, you know, UNC University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill is where we both did our our graduate work, and that is, you know, that is hardcore Baptist country, and so to a lot of the people, um, you know, I I lived in, in Durham the whole time, and so to a lot of the people who I met who identified as Baptist or other Christian denominations, if I had told them. Oh, what's it like to practice a Middle Eastern religion? You know, like they they would have been very surprised at me framing it that way. And yet, from a you know, if we look at history as uh, you know names and dates and places, um, you know, arguably, uh, and this is especially key in you know from where we used to go to school, but but arguably, um, here, I didn't looking because I wrote down the the date. Where is it? Um, <laughs> that, that, you know, if we look at, uh, you know, the, the Mayflower, you know, landing Plymouth Rock, the whole, you know, early 1600s bit, um, that another way of framing Christianity in America is to look at, you know, in the early 1500s, 1531, um, the appearance of the Virgin of Guadalupe to an indigenous mm -hmm. man named Juan Diego, um, you know, in the, this hill of Tepeyac, um, that, that is in Mexico. Um, and, you know, that what then happens is that that is held up as part of sort of the, again, the, the myth in a, as part of a sacred truth or history of, um, 
in this case, Catholicism, but Christianity establishing itself um, here in the quote unquote new world. Um, and that continues to be a massive, massively important sort of symbol um, within Mexican and certainly Mexican American, you know, culture. Um, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I, I think that's interesting, right? Because I sometimes, I, I do, right? I think of like Christianity is the big American influence, but I often don't think of it as a big Mexican influence, right? I just, I don't, I guess I don't have that, that framework. Um, so we had a quick question from our audience, um, which is just if you could explain a little bit more about what a diaspora is. Of course. So um, a wonderful question. And thank you for being on top of it and jumping in right away. So a diaspora would be, imagine a community, however you define it, like ethnically or religiously. Um, and they have a quote unquote homeland. And then the people who are members of that community, but who live elsewhere, are part of the diaspora. I mean, could you think of a, a better definition, Jen? Yeah, or? I mean, I think for, um, when I think of diaspora, right, I think not only um, when members of the community don't, don't live in the so-called homeland, right, whether that homeland is real or mythical, right, to go back to our discussion of myth. Um, I guess for me, because I actually, I do refugee studies, right, um, I also think of diaspora as having a connotation of people being driven out, right? Or not being allowed to return to their homeland or it being very difficult for them to return for a variety of reasons. I think that's sure. how, the, how the term is often used. Um, yeah, d definitely. I think, yeah, I mean, definitely in the context of of refugees, then I, I think it applies. Um, yeah, you, I, I like your your definition. Maybe maybe my definition is more. Um, you know, it's always amazing with these terms in a dictionary. You find multiple definitions. Um, so right there, we have you know uh, maybe a basic, straightforward definition, and then your definition, Jen, is much more of one uh, in a particular in a, a particular type of context. Mm -hmm. But know. I think. It I think it matches the historical story too that you were discussing, right? Because the Puritans literally, like they did have to run, right? They were refugees. And then as you point out, right, we we get several of these colonies, right? That are, if I'm understanding it right, largely in response to the religious wars that are sort of racking Europe. That That's right. So if we look at... Um you know, both, so like Pennsylvania, William Penn, he needs a place for the Quakers to go and be quiet. <laughs> um, uh, Lord Baltimore needs a place. He wants there to be a place for English Catholics to go and be able to practice Catholicism safely. I mean, I mean, if you think about the the level of work involved in establishing a colony and getting a charter for a colony for um, you know, in the 1600s, um, you know, this is not like some big vanity project. Right. This is this is people who are of means. I mean, you know, Lord Baltimore, right? Not pauper Baltimore. Um, and and so there's a response to a particular need for a safe space for these people, you know, to gather. And I, I and that um what's interesting to me is you know, and this is where we can look at the intersection of, of religion and, and race is that when we move outside of, um, you know, different Christian denominations and we look at the case study of someone like Omar bin Sayyid, who is, um, you know, born in 1770 and then uh, is enslaved from what's now modern day Senegal, um, enslaved in 1807 and brought to the U.S. Um, you know, he's, he's Muslim, he's educated, uh, he writes a slave narrative and autobiography in Arabic that, that we have. And um, I think we can, there's a wonderful link to it, or we'll share a wonderful link to it in the show notes afterwards. Um, you know, I mean, he's buried in, in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, and, and so the estimates are, they vary, of course, these things are hard to pinpoint, but, you know, somewhere from, you know, two and a half to 10 percent, I think 10 percent is the ultimate high side, but um, of the uh, Africans who were enslaved and, and brought to the Americas, you know, were Muslim. And so when we fast forward a bit in terms of t chronology and time period, mm 
and we get to these ideas of, you know, Muslim bans and, you know, Muslims need to go home or whatever. Um, I mean, Islam has been one of those um, pieces of this, you know, quilt that we could call, you know, America, um, if we look at it in terms of religious um, terms. And um, even, you know, similarly, uh, certainly, you know, Jewish communities have faced a great deal of prejudice in, um, you know, immigrating to the U.S. And, and integrating into kind of broad, you know, into society. And, um, you know, we have very early Jewish communities in, in New York, for example. And what's interesting is, while today we might think of um, Jewish communities in, in, in New York along the East Coast as being predominantly of Ashkenazi or, you know, Eastern European descent, these earliest communities are actually of Sephardic Jews who have their roots more in, um, you know, uh, in, in Spain. Um, and then, of course, following the reconquest of, of Spain in 1492, then massive um, numbers of them are expelled and then find their home in, you know, places like Morocco, modern day Morocco and Tunisia and Algeria and even as far away as, as uh, Istanbul, um, mm -hmm. let alone throughout then the, the Americas. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, different communities here that we can, we can talk about. But I think what, what, I, what I see is drawing them together is this shared experience of being from somewhere else and then trying to get established here and then enduring some difficulties. And that's where this sort of promise and warning comes in is I think there's supposed to be this promise of it being this open and welcoming place. And, um, you know, the existence of the, you know, the Catholic school system in this country is evidence to the contrary, because when Catholics immigrated, especially in the 1800s in large numbers, um, you know, again, from Germany, Italy and, and, and Ireland, um, you know, and including some of my ancestors from, from Luxembourg, um, not Germany, not France, <laughs> work. Get it this right. is a very important distinction, I understand. This is, it is. Um, then, you know, the reason, I mean, one main reason for the establishment of a separate school system was because those immigrant communities understood that the quote unquote public school system was really in effect the Protestant school system. Mm -hmm. um, and so a scholar like Jay Dolan, who writes about the American Catholic immigrant experience during this time period has all these this, all these archival, you know, this research that, that they've done um, documenting just the experience that these um, Catholic communities were having with their kids in the public school and, you know, teachers criticizing them in front of the class for, you know, believing in the saints and worshiping the Virgin Mary and all this stuff. I mean, I mean, the term, you know, hocus pocus in and of itself is a, a sort of Reformation era slur against Catholics, right? The Latin mass um, where the priest holds up the, the body of Christ and says, hocus meum corpus, this is my body. So hocus pocus then is just a um, you know, way of making fun of that, right? Because that was a big part of the Reformation. That was you know, a critique of the kind of the quote unquote magical aspect of Catholicism, whereas the Protestants saw themselves as ultimately rational. Oh, but now I'm, I really like the movie hocus pocus. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that movie is really good in my mythology class around Halloween when we work with the um, folklore theorist Vladimir Prop, um, morphology of a folktale. That movie hits all of his steps. Anyway, I mean, I don't want to. People should watch whatever they want to watch. Um, <laughs> but all of these words have 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 origins. All of these phrases have have origins. Um, there's also a really great episode of The Simpsons where um, Bart. Um, and Homer are tempted to convert to Catholicism, and then Marge has all of these um, anxieties about it, um, mm -hmm. and her because they belong to I don't know if their congregation is supposed to be Methodist. Um, I think maybe they are, uh, and and so the the minister is like, oh, you can't let them get baptized because then, you know, the magical act of being baptized will mean that they'll never come back to our community. So then Marge has to like break up the the baptism. Hmm. Oh my goodness. Well, yeah, so this is, <laughs> I mean, I could talk about The Simpsons all day, but I think it does raise this really interesting thing that you sort of alluded to a little bit earlier that I kind of wanted to like sort of pick up on, right, which is even though when you look at the history, as you point out, right, all of these different religious practices have been present, like in the United States 
um, since sort of the colonization, right? Like, you know, uh, where we talk about Islam, right? And the Puritans and Catholics and Jews. And then you think, but then there's this thing that as you say, right, sort of start, we see it more and more where it's like, if you're Catholic, you're not American American, right? Or you need to have a different school or the school system, which is supposed to be, I suppose, neutral is not being neutral, right? The hocus pocus and making fun, as you say. Th that's right. I and mean, I think, you know, two great examples of this are, um, you know, when, when John F. Kennedy Jr. runs for, or when John F. Kennedy excuse me, runs for office, he gives this famous speech in 1960 to the, um, the Greater Houston Ministerial Association, which is basically where he goes before this group of Protestant ministers and says, don't worry, if I'm elected, the Pope is not going to actually be running the show. Um, and that's the main purpose of, of that speech. And that was a major thing that he had to overcome because uh, up until that point, right, there had never been a Roman Catholic who, who was elected to, to office. I mean, if you look at historically, it's, it's dominated by, by Protestants um, and specific denominations of Protestants, like Episcopalians, Presbyterians, and, and so forth. Maybe a few deists thrown in there in the early stages. Maybe, um, and 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 then if you if you flash forward, roughly fifty years, and you look at Mitt Romney's campaign in two thousand and seven, Mitt Romney goes to the um, the George H W Bush Library in College Station, Texas. So there's again a Texas connection, and gives a speech where he basically does the same thing that Kennedy did. Mm -hmm. um, and Romney even, if you, you can look up and we can provide a link to this as well, the text of the speech, but Romney even says, you know, 50 years ago, there was another candidate for Massachusetts who had to go and tell everyone that, you know, his faith was basically acceptable. Um, and maybe it's different from yours in certain respects, but at the end of the day, we're all, you know, American. Um, and so we have this, this part uh, you know, we see in the political process, right, where people have to sort of demonstrate that if they come from what I'll call a, a non-normative um, strain of, of Christianity, uh, let alone someone who's not Christian running for, for president, um, then, uh, which we haven't had, <laughs> um, uh, but then they have to sort of do this song and dance to demonstrate that they are acceptable. Um you know, and I think you can compare it to some of the the things that Hillary Clinton had to overcome as a as a candidate in her. You know, I mean, obviously she she lost, and most people accepted it without making too much of a of a ruckus. Um, and you know, she had to demonstrate that as the first, if she was going to be the first woman to be president, that that was going to be okay. Mm. Right? People didn't need to to freak out. So the type of anxiety that that the electorate um, has about these things will will differ. But at the end of the day, what, you know, we had these examples both in terms of religion and gender. With Obama, it was race. Um, you know, when we have we have a normative image of who a person is, and I just want to add that in addition to race and gender, that religion has often ha has has been part of that normative image that people have. And, you know, so goes who we think is eligible for the highest office in the land. So too then goes our running definition of who we think is quote unquote really American or who really belongs. Um, and that, that's why that episode of The Simpsons is, is so great because they, they highlight this, um, you know, Protestant anxiety. Um, like Marge has an image of heaven and, um, you know, the Catholic, or I'm sorry, the, well, the Catholics are having lots of fun. Um, they're Irish and they're Mexican in this episode, right? And they're, they're having like this total party. And, and then Marge finds her group and they're playing croquet and it's a very subdued affair. Uh, and, and, and which is, you know, is, that's just, again, it's just an episode of The Simpsons. But um, what I like about it is that it illustrates the way that this, at a pop culture level, that these types of ideas are are still with us, mm -hmm. right? They're they're still there. Yeah, but then there's like 
but then it strikes me, I mean, that there's a huge worry, right? As you say, right, the promise and the warning, right? Because I, I mean, I grew up in rural Indiana, right? I too, I, I, I learned this, right? Like America, you know, America, freedom of religion is the, you know, one of the rocks upon which we're founded to go back to a Bible story, right? Um, but then this notion that, you know, that JFK had to come, basically like come out as Catholic and say that it would be fine, right? And then Mitt Romney sort of having to do the same thing and be like, it's okay, squad. Like I'm really an American. I think it it draws out maybe a, a real flaw in that foundation, right? Like, is it possible to move beyond kind of this notion that like, look, if you're not a certain brand of Christian, you're not really an American. I like, think, you know, I was thinking about this in preparation for the talk and it actually took me, I, what are the term I use with my students a lot is the, if we look at the source code mm. of a tradition, or in this case of a of the project that I call America, then, which first of all, you know, most of them when they make their websites, they don't have to deal with like manually coding like, you know, I did back back in the day where with Dreamweaver, you would like bring up the code and make sure you've got your bracket, you know, all those brackets, every, everything right. Yeah. your backslashes. Um, and, and so that, you know, I have to update my references. But um, <laughs> but I, I, what, what I want to point out is, is we, if we do look at the source code of this thing that we'll call America, um, there are some implicit, there's a whole series of implicit prejudices and thus exclusions built in to, even if we go back to that first amendment, you know, um, you know, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. In practice, what that ended up meaning was every time someone who wasn't a particular type of Christian wanted to assert that right, that right was not like freely given, right? It had to be litigated. It had to be protested. People had to do everything they could to, to get that right, including, you know, if we look at communities um, like the cases around Native Americans using peyote in, in certain rituals, right? Because then we run into this whole Western biomedical paradigm, um, right? Where, where then, because of the way that peyote was being classified in terms of uh, you know, an intoxicant, then it was like, oh, no, you can't use that freely. But then they said, well, wait, what about this? There's this thing. You have this constitution. You I, see, I, it I, matters. <laughs> we, we, yeah. the constitution. we certainly talk a lot about the constitution, right? Um, we yes. see it matters. Yeah, and, and, and it does. And I think, you know, this has been one, one thing about the last, you know, depending on how you frame it for, well, yeah, definitely four years, but longer than that too, that these um, institutions that we have in the country, um, you know, the separation of powers and the way that these institutions are set up, it's to provide a process through which everyone gets oftentimes literally their, their day in court. But I think the fact that people have to sue oftentimes for their rights um, testifies to how part of the source code in America of, of this project of America is, oh, we have like a set of standards that are evolving over time, but when you run up against them, there's gonna be friction as opposed to, oh, you wanna do that? And we haven't had that around here in the past. Well, let's come and let's just see how it goes. Um, there tends to be a reaction of, oh, that's different. Um, I don't, we don't want that certainly in our, in our backyard. And if we look, for example, at some of the cases um, in terms of Muslim communities here in, in the U.S., you know, I think a classic example, and we see these cases popping up in Europe as well, are where there are um, laws that are passed prohibiting the broadcasting of the adhan, the call to prayer. Um, saying that under that it's it's a nuisance sort of so you know I mean I live I live in Boulder so when I think of a, a noise ordinance nuisance I think of some wild party on the hill um, <laughs> right after CU wins a wins a football game um, and so to to think about how people are using the same type of at the level of the municipal laws and trying to enforce them they're applying that same stuff to religious practice or religious exercise. Um, and there's, 
there's a tension there. And then the fact that most Muslims in the U.S. are not white, right, then we, we get what, I mean, the visuals of it are pretty clear, is you have a group of people who are mostly either, you know, first or second, sometimes third generation immigrants, and then, and then African Americans and a small number of white Americans who are congregating to practice their religion, and the local town or city, or however you define the municipal unit, is passing laws saying, no, you can't, you can't do this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's a noise ordinance and sometimes oh, you don't have enough of a parking permit for that number of people gathering there, which is why, um, and this is a great sort of story of how religious institutions sort of help one another, um, or they can, they can take, they can leverage this legal side to their, to their benefit. Um, if, a, if you have a, a building that's already zoned as a religious site, right? Then there's all this stuff built in about like parking and mm. and whatnot. And so then if if religious community A says, oh, we're really small, we don't need this space. And then religious community B comes in, then religious community B, no matter who they are, um, inherit, <laughs> right? They're grandfathered in, um, mm -hmm. in these really important ways that allows, that encourages the free exercise issue or encourages them to be able to, to freely exercise. Well, and I think there's, there's, I think there's sort of like a couple of interesting questions there, right? Which is sort of one, um, so to go to, to talk about the source code, right? Um, I sort of am, am wondering if you could say a little bit more maybe about how that source code, right, comes to be so dominantly Christian, especially when, as you point out, right, the history at least since the colonization, right? And, and before that, right, as well, although like the records are maybe less good, um, is, a, is a history of the coexistence of many religious traditions, right? So as you say, right, we've got a bunch of religious traditions and a bunch of religious groups coming over, right? And establishing themselves. And then somehow, right, we get this sort of domination Right or certainly, if not domination, a certain normative claim about like who counts and who doesn't, despite the coexistence of religious traditions. Um, well, I think one thing that's helpful is, um, even though I've you know been doing this largely in this in this discussion, it, we always need to remember that you know people have more than one sort of identity, mm -hmm. right? That identity is is multifaceted, and so while we can look from a sort of exclusively sort of sort of religious history or history of religions lens and see, as you're saying, the, all these different religious communities that come over and, and attempt to, to, to coexist, you know, it, um, there's also, you know, it's political, um, the, uh, the strife and the conflict from the quote unquote old old world, they bring that with them. And they also then are having this encounter within the indigenous nations. And, um, you know, whether it's the Spanish, you know, arriving in um, sort of, you know, Central America or, or what's now Mexico um, or the, you know, the people in what we now call New England. Um, th there's one thing that, that I think largely we, we can agree on historically is there's a, pretty immediately, there's a push, there's a push to say, um, you know, this land is our land <laughs> and it's no longer going to be your land. And it's not our land in the global sense. It is our land in the, in the specific sense. And, and that's because this expansion also happens in the context of, of European, um, empire. Um, and this is where, I mean, Steph, certainly in the case of the Spanish and the Portuguese, uh, a really great classic film on this is the mission, um, yeah. that looks at how Spanish and Portuguese colonial efforts in, um, in Central and, and South America, how that, and how the, uh, the Jesuits were bound up in that whole process and, you know, in good ways and, and bad because they're, they're human. Um, and, and so I, when I, when I think about the coexistence claim, I think I'm like, yeah, people were coexisting on paper, but for example, in the Maryland, you know, case, um, 
you know, these Puritans at one point came and said, no, no, no more Catholic colony. Um, Lord Baltimore doesn't get to be in charge. His descendants don't get to be in charge. Eventually one of his descendants says, no, I'm really a Protestant. And then they let him be in charge. Um, so that's why history is exciting (laughs) because, because it is wild. Um, you know, when you humanize it, then it's unpredictable. And that, that makes for, from a narrative, from a literary standpoint, that makes it intriguing. Yeah. Yeah, Like I, it does suggest sort of a religious identity test, right? In a very real way, which is some, right? Which is something that Americans aren't supposed to do. Well, we're not supposed to do lots of things. Um, you know, in my mythology class, we were talking about the, the creation stories, no plural, there's two of them in Genesis, and uh, how in, in, in those stories, there's an interdiction, right? You're not supposed to, God says, you have everything you need, just don't eat this one thing. One thing. But we can't really resist doing that which we are prohibited, which, you know, all of us who are parents know that the surest way to ensure that the little one does behavior X is to say, don't do behavior X. It's really simple. It never works. I mean, if you look at it from the Genesis point of view, it literally hasn't worked from the very beginning. (laughs) <laughs> it literally ha- hasn't hasn't worked. And then from a more of a literary standpoint, you can say, um, unless the, the heroes of the story violate the interdiction, right? And, mm-hmm. think, you know, break the whatever the law is, um, then there's no story, right? So then these stories are ways of justifying, from a, more of a literary critical standpoint, these stories are ways of justifying how we, um, how we are. Mm-hmm. But, you know, so I think that's part of what the story of, of America is, um, is it's, it's trying, it's presenting an ideal. I think this is an important thing is that I, I don't think this was ever really descriptive. I think mm-hmm. it's always been aspirational and, um, and I'm okay with that because um, if, unless we recognize that it's, that it was never descriptive and that it's aspirational, then we're never going to actually make any any progress. Um, we're never going to be able to look at, you know, the experience of, of African Americans in this country in a realistic way, unless there's a real dig deep and, and deal with the truth of what those people have experienced day in, day out. Not just, you know, sometimes it's like, I think this is appropriate during, um, you know, the month of, of February, where we're, so, we're, you know, we're sort of nationally committed. Of course, we take the shortest month of the year and we dedicate that to, to Black history. Um, and and so we're supposed to be thinking all about Martin Luther King Jr. and everything. But, um, but all this stuff that, you know, all the protests this summer were a wake-up call for a lot of people that this stuff has been going on you know, the, the injustice and the, and the racism and everything has been going on for, I mean, for a very, very long time. I mean, that's what the Project 1619 was was about that the New York Times did. Um, it was sort of highlighting that this has been part of our of our story from, from the beginning. Um, and there is no way to tell a fully... I think a holistic story of how we are, who we are without dealing with these, um, I guess from a Jungian point of view, the shadow sides, right? And they're, and they're not for the people who, who live it, it's not the shadow side, but, but again, for what I think we saw over the summer was a lot of white people all of a sudden saying, oh, 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 um, you know, whereas other people could have said, that's what's been going on for a long time. We just didn't have cell phone cameras to capture all of this stuff. Um, so again, you know, religion comes into this identification of who, who gets to belong. And, you know, even though we're founded on this, this uh, supposedly founded on this ideal of, you know, a nation where everyone gets to belong, um, that has not been the historical reality. Mm-hmm. It just, it just hasn't been. I, I don't think there's a way to um, consciously argue the other side, the, the reverse. You know, I, I, I really, I really don't. Um, 
yeah i mean we we can i can go on <laughs> are there any questions from the uh audience that you you want to get to um because I, I then i can also um i can talk about yoga if, yeah. if you want to talk about that i want you to talk about yoga but before we talk about yoga um uh so yeah um so one uh one point that comes up is that um there's a little bit of a concern, right? So when we, I think from the literary crit perspective, right, that you raised, um, if we understand right then this other myth of America as like, we're the sort of scrappy new kids, right? And we break the yes. rules and we're gonna, do, I mean, I think this is also a, 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 a mythos of America, right? Is we are the new kids on the block and like, we're gonna have a democracy, like by kings. And we're going to break the rules, right? But then you might think that, like, the First Amendment is a rule that we don't want to break, right? I'm going to have a religious identity test whether or not I'm supposed to, right? And I'm going to make fun of Catholic kids in schools. And I'm going to say you can't be both Jewish and American, right? I've heard, I've seen that in the news lately. And that's that seems like a rule we don't want to break, <laughs> And so I think there's a maybe a, a worry here about these kinds of narratives and what they can cause us to do, maybe. I mean, in many ways, I think I would argue we, we are products of our mythology. Mm. And so um, part of our mythology in, in America is, you know, this sort of I think this especially applies out here in the, you know, the Mountain West, right, where these pioneers, these rugged individualists, um, you know, I'm going to come out here and settle my land and don't, don't bother me. Um, we, but, you know, even here, um, it's been interesting growing up in, in Virginia, um, we, we, you know, we didn't, we, in school, we didn't talk about Native American nations i mean i mean like it was that was it uh, i mean we just didn't we talked about all the virginians who had become president <laughs> <laughs> perfect you know I mean, there have been a lot of virginians who became yeah president. it's it's true it's true um and I'll, I'll get to thomas jefferson's quran in in a second um but but out here you know i noticed when i moved here for the first time in, in 2005 um, and I was talking with, with my wife and I was like, you know, the airport is designed to look sort of like, have this like Native American, you know, sort of architecture out, we're, we're out on the plains. This is how buildings such as they were, you know, were built. Um, and just talking to people here, there was so much more awareness that was kind of built into the, the, the school system. Um, and I think that's part of because the sort of European and European descended sort of settlers, um, that's even just much more recent than when you're out on, on the East Coast. And so that history is much more, much more recent. And, and so like right now, you know, in Colorado, we have the statewide commission to look at the renaming of, of mountains and other sort of yeah. landmarks. Um, you know, will it still be Pikes Peak or, or will it be something else? Um, and that's part of this movement that's been going on for, for a while to sort of recognize that these places not only <laughs> obviously had other names, but that these names that these um, indigenous nations have given to many of these places, especially um, part of the physical geography, that those places are important to their sort of religious you know, system. Mm -hmm. Now, oftentimes um, when Europeans encountered indigenous communities all over the world there was sort of like a litmus test like oh do they have religion or not yeah um and so if they it, and, and this test largely followed again a protestant model and in, in my own field of religious studies we're always talking about this protestant legacy that our field has and what that means is a, uh the you know the first one is is there a single all-powerful deity um and then is there a book you, you gotta have you gotta have a book you got to have text. You got to have text that we can read. Um, and if you do not have a text that 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 you can read, then we will translate the Bible into your text, into your language. We will help you create 
uh, you know, uh, an alphabet, so to speak. And, and then there you'll have the, the book that you'll need. Um, and, and so that applies both if we look at colonial efforts in, let's say, Africa and in the Americas, um, you know, for sure, it's kind of a very, a very consistent um, thing. Yeah. yeah, that's, oh man, that's wild, right? Because it leads into sort of, I, I wanted to go back to the legal issue that you you raised and then we sort of got away from, right? Which is, this isn't only sort of a social question, right? Um, because as you point out, um, freedom of religious practice is enshrined in the constitution, which means it then becomes a legal question. Um, and so I was hoping we could, we could, let's talk about the legal stuff that comes up. I want to talk about yoga. Okay. All right. Um, so the famous case that was decided recently in California is called Sedlock v. Baird from 2015. And um, so in the Encinitas um, school system, they were introducing yoga, like as a, you know, mindfulness practice, uh, exercise practice for, for the kids. And so there was a family that sued saying this was a violation of the establishment clause because you're enshrining the practice from their point of view, you're, you're teaching a religious practice in school. And, oh, I thought we weren't you know, supposed to do that because we've had all these court cases around school prayer and the Pledge of right. Allegiance. And, you know, this is a, you know, has been debated. Um, right. And so... Ten, ten, ten Commandments in school is a no-go, right? Yeah. That, I, that's right. That's how that's how the judges have, have decided it. Yeah. Um, and so in this case, what was so fascinating was that, you know, of course, both parties brought their their um, expert witnesses and the, the state brought or the school district brought these, you know, scholars who were trained in, in, in South Asian religions. Um, and the, the Sedlock the plaintiff brought um, uh, a scholar who's trained more in like the study of religion in America, um, which was just interesting when I found that out because the one scholar argued that yoga is inherently religious, that no matter if you strip out the Sanskrit mantras, um, you know, instead of lotus pose, you call it crisscross applesauce, <laughs> um, you, you know, so you try and like de-religionize it as much as you can. Um, then the, the scholars on the other side argued, well, it is religious, but it belongs to so many different religious traditions that it, it de facto cannot violate the establishment clause because the establishment clause is understood as, as pertaining to the raising up or the establishing of one religion over all others, um, you know, sort of in Lord of the Rings terms, one religion <laughs> to rule them all. And, and so, you know, these scholars pointed out that we have Jain yoga and Hindu yoga and Buddhist yoga. Um, and so because yoga is found, you know, in these different religious traditions in, in India, that um, it can't, it can't violate the establishment clause. And so the judge ultimately ruled in the school, district, school district's favor, um, saying that they had thoroughly, I actually wrote down the, um, I wrote down the, the language from the decision because I thought it was interesting. He said, while the practice of yoga may be religious in some context, yoga classes as taught by the district are, quote, devoid of any religious, mystical, or spiritual trappings. Now, there's another thing to think about here, which would go into like Orientalism and the exoticization of especially quote unquote Eastern religions. Um, and, you know, we, we're probably familiar with the real boom in, in the teaching of mindfulness. Um, for example, the, the mindfulness based stress reduction clinic that John Cabot Zinn has been a part of. Um, you know, this became a big thing sort of in Silicon Valley in the 80s. And it was like, oh, if we get our workers to meditate, they'll be more productive. <laughs> so from a capitalist point of view, it's awesome. Because the workers that are more productive and if they're meditating, maybe they're a bit calmer. And <laughs> so you can be critical of it from that point of view. But from another point of view, there's the whole idea that if you take these practices that come out of very specific historical, cultural, and yes, religious contexts, and you strip out all that context, then what are you left with? Especially when a lot of these um, practices, especially looking at yoga and, and meditation generally, 
um, have a strong ethical component. And so what happens when we, we strip that out? Um, that's something else that, you know, I think more and more people are, are looking at. Um, you know, people ask me about the whole sort of exoticization of Eastern religions. and like, oh, what do you mean? I'm like, well, have you heard of the force? You know, I mean, like George Lucas coming from California. I mean, I used to know someone who, when I was practicing Aikido and he was like, oh yeah, I, I practiced Aikido with, with, you know, with Lucas back in the sixties um, or seventies. And, uh, you know, he's obviously drawing on this sort of potpourri of quote unquote Eastern religious traditions when he puts together, um, you know, the Star Wars universe. And, you know, we've kind of run with it, especially people my, my age. My students now are like, what, Star Wars, you know? No, um, that's so depressing. Everybody who's watching, if you haven't watched Star Wars, go watch Star Wars, right? And, <laughs> and, be, and, and be critical of it. I mean, you know, I, yes. I, of anything. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that's another example of how, um, you know, religion shows up in multiple ways in our sort of cultural um, climate. And uh, I mean, you have people who sort of started like a new, what we would call in our field, um, a new religious movement, you know, Jediism, which is all over the world. So, although there's no fear about creeping Jediism, there used to be fear about creeping Sharia, but that's because of Islamophobia, um, which we can also get, get into. But, but I think that the Sedlock case and, and the, you know, in looking at yoga, you know, um, is a good, is a good example of you know, can people, because there's this question that people have, um, especially people who belong to religious communities that doctrinally are more sort of closed um, and, and feel like, well, we have a way of being and um, we don't want to do anything that's outside of that way. So then here comes yoga and it's like, well, I have my way of doing things, but I also want to be able to touch my toes and I want to be able to, you know, improve my core strength. And so the question is, um, if I'm doing something with my body, this is where we also brush up against the sort of Protestant legacy we have of um, how we define religion, which, which that legacy has ultimately been much more geared towards the mind, much mm -hmm. more geared towards what do I believe inside, right, internally, as opposed to what am I doing with my body. Um, so yoga, you're doing stuff with your body, right? And so... Um, you know, ultimately it's, it's intended to be this practice that um, in terms of a, the asanas or the, the poses are supposed to prepare you for um, a deeper meditative state. Um, but there's also a lot of yoga that has nothing to do with, you know, bending over and touching your toes. You know, it's more like this yogic philosophy. And so the hatha yoga, or, well, again, that's force yoga. <laughs> It's what it translates to. Um, that is just one part of, of yoga. You know, in another part of my professional life, I talk about um, Muslim engagement with yoga, especially in, during the Mughal dynasty. And I always have to rush and say, no, 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 at Akbar's court, they were not doing sun salutations, you know, that, that we know of. We have no textual evidence to, um, to attest that. Oh, but that's such a good mental image. Right? It is. It fire, is. Right? Like doing some amazing sun salutations, right? Yeah, I think probably other people nearby maybe were doing that, but it wasn't part of, you know, <laughs> yeah, there were other elements of Hinduism that were integrated within the, the Mughal dynasty that we could talk about. Um, Look, don't, yeah, not don't, don't ruin my dream. Don't ruin my dream. Um, but I do, I, I do find this yoga case really fascinating, right? Because I remember when you and I first talked about it, my response was like, oh, but my kid does yoga in her gym class. And she comes home and she's like, look, I learned this meditative breath thing for when I'm upset and it calms me down. And I'm sitting here going, her gym teacher is a genius. Like, that's so good. Like, I'm so glad she's learning yoga. Um, but I think it is this interesting question right like does it represent a, a good kind of religious diversity a worrying kind of religious diversity that we should be concerned about like how do we and then right because I take it one thing we can do as you say is sort of try to strip the yogic practices 
of their religious context, but then it, that also seems like we're doing something wrong, right? That seems like a really worrying appropriation, um, especially when we consider sort of the history of India and, and Indian practices of yoga sort of vis-a-vis -vis the Western world. And also that we live in a country that's built on the extraction of, of precious resources, both human and mineral and all other kinds um, from, from different places. So I think from as we consider it, it's not just an abstract problem for, you know, a bunch of, you know, PhDs to, to think about. Um, I think there are a lot of ethical concerns with, and this is what yoga brings up in, in my work is um, when we talk about yoga, um, you know, like, is it a problem that most of the people who practice yoga in the U.S., right, don't, they don't know any, any Sanskrit. Um, they, you know, is, is that good? Is that, is that bad? I think a lot of people would say, like, that's not, not a problem because yoga has been put into a box that has taken all the, you know, the Devanagari labels has been, have been taken off the box. And then you open the box and you're given this sort of cultural product um of, of yoga and you know whether it's you know at studios that are about empowering your core or um you know studios that promise more of a like religious or spiritual sort of experience um these are these questions are up for you know for debate um i think you know i've been <laughs> I've, 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 heard, I've read so many different little anecdotes about people figuring out how they're going to make this sort of this blending of, of traditions, you know? So I've heard of, um, you know, very um, passionate Christians who are like, well, when I go upside down, you know, when I do, um, you know, pose like a headstand, then I'm going to take my, my little image of Jesus and I'm going to flip him upside down too. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just one, I mean, that's just one person, uh, you know, that, but that's just an example of the type of, you know, literal sort of flexibility that a lot of people have when they're trying to figure out, okay, here's this thing that I want to do, but I have this concern about whether or not I should do it. Right. And this comes up um, in my, in my other, you know, research on sort of Muslim engagement with, with yoga. There's this question of, oh, well, is, is this, am I allowed to do this? If, if, you know, yeah. so if someone is Muslim and they want to do yoga, then, then can I do that? And then, so then, you know, I look at all these, you know, historical examples um, where people have said yes, and some people have said no, and, you know, what their rationale ha has been. I, I think what's really fascinating about the Sudlock case is that what was brought was this charge of you're violating the First Amendment. Yeah. It was not, hey, I'm, I'm Christian, or I'm Jewish, or I'm Muslim, um, and I don't want my kid to uh, learn this thing that I consider as a part of Hindu tradition, um, that may have been the sort of private reasoning, but there was a recognition that when you bring a court case, you have to argue in the public sphere. And so then we're left with things like the constitution and the first amendment and the, the bill of rights um, and all the other, you know, case law, right. And the interpretations of those founding documents to determine what constitutes um, an establishment of one religion over and against all others. What constitutes a prohibition on free exercise? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it's so interesting, right, to think about what you know what what counts as establishing, right, and also what counts as a religion, right. So, as you say, right during col during the colonization, right, it was sort of these really weird tests, right. But I, but to be fair, I. I guess I had a sort of similar reaction when you told me this case. I was like, I didn't even, I didn't think of yoga that way, right? Which is my bad. Um, well, it's, I mean, like, no, I, I'm, I'm not here to call, to say anyone's, to say anyone's bad. Um, you know, religious studies, not theology. I leave that to theologians and, their, and insider discussions. Um, right. But what is interesting about another part of the, or another piece of the discussion about yoga is, that the current government in India with Modi in, in charge and the, and the BJP in charge, they have been much more assertive about, hey, this is our thing, um, which is then part of, even though, you know, India is I mean, a way larger country population wise than, than we are, of course, um, mm -hmm. but they're a huge, you know, a hugely diverse 
you know, nation. So we have that in, in common. Um, and, uh, but what's interesting is that the assertion of yoga as being, oh no, we're going to assert that this is a really Hindu thing is then interpreted as, well, then people who aren't Hindu shouldn't, shouldn't do it. Or it becomes more of a tense question is that, and so that the the debate then you know the contours of it shift quite a bit when we're say in India or you know someplace like Malaysia or Indonesia um, you know there's a lot of these yoga teachers that like to do these these wonderfully I'm sure they're amazing these retreats to Bali and you know Bali has this fascinating status as this Hindu island a literal island um, that's has a predominantly Hindu population but within the world's largest Muslim country being Indonesia. Um, and, you know, you can go online and find like, you know, you know, this cleric published a fatwa banning yoga, but, you know, uh, number one, that's not really the way the fatwas work. Um, and, and number two, um, people are, are, you know, Muslims around the world are still going and doing yoga. There's a great book that I'll give a shout out to, cause I can't wait until the movie version of it comes out. It's, um, it's an, it's an adaptation of Pride and Prejudice. Uh, it's called Aisha at Last, um, and uh, it's based in the sort of suburbs of Toronto. And there's this one scene where there's this yoga class at this mosque, and um, you know one of the characters goes, and you know they're doing this class. And at no point does anyone in the class think, "Oh, is this? Are we allowed to do that?" Like that's not a question that that community is having, mm -hmm. um, which I think is such a great, you know, I mean, you know, art imitates life. Um, and, and so I, I think that's one example of, you know, again, the eye of one author, like how she depicted that community. She chose to, to weave that in as a, as a detail. Um, and similarly, we can find, um, you know, Christians who are, uh, adapting or, you know, shifting the nomenclature of what certain yoga poses are called to, um, to make it fit more with their theological commitments um you know yoga is if, if nothing else it is quite flexible <laughs> two points that was really good <laughs> um yeah but i think i mean i do think it's interesting right because we can talk about this kind of being in essence right kind of the promise of religious diversity right because people are then able to as you say kind of make their own decisions right and kind of muddle their way through about how to meld these things, right? However they want to do it because there's not the establishment, right? Of any one religion. Um, and I think I think that's really neat, but I do want to, I want to ask if we can turn more towards the, uh, more towards the warning just with our last sort of 15 minutes or so. Of course, yes, um, we have to get to the warning. We have to get yeah. to the warning, right? Because, um, because as, as you say, right? Like once you have free exercise, you really have free exercise. Um, I want to talk about the insurrection on January. Yes. Can we talk about so, that? Because yeah, so between insurrection, cross. yeah, between insurrection and inauguration. Um, so if you look at the images um, from both events, right, the video that we can all look at online from, from the insurrection on January 6th, um, and then the inauguration, obviously, in the same approximate space on you know two weeks later you see people displaying their bibles um you see people you know there's like there's the cross or this these very important christian symbols i mean joe biden took his oath of office on this like massive here i'll put it like this yeah, so you see my hand it was massive mass i mean you looked at it, i was like wow that's like the biggest bible i've i've ever seen um and, and so from a scholarly standpoint, I looked at, at that and um, actually Sam um, Boyd up here at, at CU had a wonderful piece that we can also include in the show notes, kind of where he, he talked about this, but um, right. So this has to do with how we define religion that, that these symbols are, they are, they are just that they are symbols and we use them. Um, we, we load them up with different types of signification of meaning. And so, so for the person who, you know, broke into the Capitol and has this cross then, and this Bible, then it's like that had this meaning of, you know, 
reclaiming this country, right? They were, that's, you know, I think, I think that's fair to say. Um, and, and then, you know, the way that the, the Bible has played this role, you know, at court cases, the witness is sworn in on, on a Bible. Um, we make a big deal out of, out of, out of the fact that non-Christian politicians um, choose to be sworn in on a uh, sacred text of, you know, that fits with their tradition. So, um, you know, so that great example is that uh, the first Muslim American elected to the House of Representatives, Keith Ellison from Minnesota in, in 2006, it's now Ilhan Omar's um, seat. So when Keith Ellison was elected, he was the first Muslim in the country elected to national office. Um, you know, none of the news coverage I read actually mentioned he was also the first black person from Minnesota elected to national office. Um, and so his 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 Muslimness, mm -hmm. right, was more of the exception than his his blackness. Um, but he was sworn in on on Thomas Jefferson's Quran. Um, now Thomas Jefferson was not some you know like Quran scholar, uh, I mean, obviously he read widely, but, um, you know, he had it in, in his library and then thus it's part of the, you know, the national archives. Um, and, you know, this is, and again, we have the text, our, our obsession with, <laughs> with the text. What do we do when we have someone who has tradition that's not textually driven, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that I think is a very important important question because we again the source code is this person comes to swear their oath of office they need a book right they need a book to put their hand on or put one hand on the book and the other hand to is kind of like up towards the deity so what do we do when we have people whose religious practice their religious worldview is is different you know um i think ideally uh it if we look at this promise that we've talked about, then it's it's not a big deal, you know. It's a description as opposed to a description of of difference. Um, and you know, in this in in a similar way that everyone had to comment on, or that you know, female politicians get their their wardrobe, you know, commented on, um, in a way that you know, oh well, that dude's just wearing a dark suit. Um, you know, it's like no one ever comments on like what designer <laughs> Joe Biden is is modeling for us, right? Um, it's not part of his of his deal. Um, so I, what I look at as the warning then is, and then when I looked at the insurrection, is here's what happens when we have <laughs> here's what happens when we have um, the the utilization of religious symbols to drive um, home a point that many people would say is, they would argue, oh, that's not, they would say, oh, that's not like true religion. I think you'll find that in the press coverage. Oh, like these these people aren't real Christians for doing this. Or for example, um, you know, the KKK are not real Christians, but they use that symbol as part of their identity. Um, you know, I have people ask me, you know, I do Islamic studies. So it's like, oh, well, you know, the 9-11 hijackers, they weren't real Muslims. And I said, you know, if obviously there's, you know, lots and lots of um, afterwards, all these Muslim scholars signed all these documents that the U.S. press didn't really pay any attention to, um, but say, no, this is not us. And so for me as this, you know, this outsider, I look at it and say, well, these people, so whether it's the insurrection or whether it's 9-11 or whether it's, you know, name, whatever act it is, you have to deal with the symbols that the actors involved um, have chosen to deploy and dig into, well, okay, what, what is it that, what type of resources are they locating within this tradition to justify this act? Why are they using it? Um, you know, like from a, a marketing point of view, like what, what is it about this particular symbol that they're using. Why why take a Bible into the Capitol? I guarantee you there are there were already Bibles there. Right. I mean, I just can't. I mean, I think there's something so like I, almost disturbing, right? And really worrying, right? Yeah, I mean, I saw that picture, right, of the guy with the Bible, right, right next to the guy with the Confederate flag, right? And then 
I mean, the pictures from outside the Capitol, right, where there was a giant cross erected next to a giant gallows. And I, I mean, I think I, like you, found that just very disturbing. And I'm not really sure how to read it, right? Like, what does that mean? Well, from a, again, from a First Amendment point of view, we have to deal with the um, somewhat perforated line between uh, free speech and hate speech. Mm -hmm. um, and this has been another issue that if we go beyond um, exclusively religious, uh, religious lens, um, you know, there's the famous case of, I think it's in Skokie, uh, God, I want to say it's Skokie, Illinois, but maybe I have that, maybe I have that wrong. I'll, so I'll look that up. But where there was a neo-Nazi group that wanted to do a march through a predominantly Jewish neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is, so here's the, I mean, this was debated in my public policy class in grad school. Okay. Is that, is that okay? Um, you know, it seems like, you know, any decent person I would say would, would say no, but, but they had to litigate it. Um, they had, they had to litigate it because uh, there was this first amendment argument. Well, it's a publicly owned street. It's a public thoroughfare. Um, I can file a application to have a parade, a march on any street. Um, and you know, these are where we, we get to the way that symbols are being used and the way that they're operating within our legal system and um, with having an increasingly diverse society, we get the, the fact that people have, you know, sometimes we, people leverage that legal system to allow themselves to, to do things that, you know, you and I would tell our young children, yeah, that's not okay to do that. But, you know, grownups, um, sometimes us grownups don't, uh, don't play by the same rules as the ones that we try and teach our, our preschoolers, or in my <laughs> case, a preschooler. <laughs> Yeah, so we have a we have a question from the audience, which is, and I think it's maybe a um, just to invite you to say a little bit more about the warning aspect, right? Which is, um, so the thought is, so are you saying, Dr. De Silva, that the warning is the idea that once you have religious symbology and iconography in place, you can use it to support the social suppression of others in in a country with religious diversity, right? With free exercise. Yes. I mean, definitely these symbols are, are used. Um, I even thought of it, and this is going to be kind of a strange pop culture reference, but in the, the Bridgerton series on, on Netflix, there's this one line where they're talking they're like, Oh, well, we're all Christians here. So everything should be fine. Uh, and, and I just thought that that was so curious um, to think of, you know, sort of, sort of Jane Austen times or what's supposed to be like 1813 um, in England. And, and yet that's this assumption. And so here in the U.S., we have this, yeah, we have as the, I want to say the caller, but the, <laughs> the, the questioner um, put it, we have this sort of, uh, I'll call it a, a regime of symbols um, that's, that, that are in, in place. And the thing is, there's ambiguity um, in these founding documents, such as in the First Amendment. And that ambiguity is what then creates this space for people to utilize those symbols um, and to rationalize it as they will. Um, and so the, the warning then is that if we, if, if we keep going along this road where we're not acknowledging the damage that we can do to one another through utilizing these symbols, then um, things are not going to get better, which mm -hmm. is what I think many of us want, especially coming into 2021 after how hard 2020 has been. Um, we, we all, I think, I think this is fair to say, we want things to get better. And yet what I think this past year has shown even more clearly than anything else that's happened, certainly in my lifetime, is that we have these fundamentally different um, sort of conceptions of, of what this country is and who it is for and who is welcome and who is not so welcome. Um, and also how to, how to count. We're not clear on, on you know, electoral math um, because 
because we have these ver- these at odds um, worldviews in which you know we cannot accept an outcome in which our person does not does not win. I mean, if that's not a um, a case of mythology, you know, being at odds with some type of you know reality, um, then I don't know what what is. And so I think that is sort of the the warning. Um, and I'll explain the reference there. So the the promise and the warning is a phrase I lifted from the you know it's important to cite your source uh, <laughs> from the um, sort of early Muslim theological school, the Mu'tazilites, and um, they were big believers in this thing called free will, which a lot of Americans are into. Um, I mean, a lot of people in general, but especially here in America, right? That was part of the, the part of the whole thing about, oh, I'm I'm not going to follow with the you know a mask ordinance because I have I have free will and I'm American and you can't tell me what to do. Um, so the Mutazilites were also into free will, but they had this this sort of anthem called um, in Arabic it's al wa'id wa wa'id, which is a play on words. So they're from the same um, three consonantal root, so Arabic, like in Hebrew, um, and Aramaic. Uh, you take three consonants and you play with them and you can derive lots of related but distinct meanings from those three consonants. So the word for book can also be the word for office or you use that root to get the word for office and then like library, author, oh, so to speak. Cool. Um, so so is the, the promise of free will, but also the warning of if you have free will, then you're responsible for what you do with it. Mm. And so for them, for the Mutazilites, that was an argument about, you know, okay, so God has given us, you know, free will, but, you know, we, we got to pay the bill, um, right? And so in, in the U.S., when I look at our, our situation where we're so polarized, we can't agree on very basic things, um, you know, the, the warning is until we can have like a shared, um, source code that we can agree on that, um, then it's going to be really, really hard. And that's not an argument against diversity by, by any means, but I think it, it for me, it is an argument in favor of having like a real, some real honest conversations. I, I would love to see something along the lines of the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that we've seen in South Africa and Rwanda, um, because we can learn things from from Africa. That would be one thing I'd like to add (laughs) to our constitution. Um, We can learn from things from other places, but I think especially especially Africa, uh, that was a way that those societies said, we've gone through this horrible trauma in some cases, it was you know months long. In some cases, it was decades long. Um, but the way through it is not to actually continue to tear each other apart. We need to have sort of a person-to-person level. We need to listen to each other's stories in very real ways. And this is where actually another intersection we haven't talked about is class. But um, you know, people in this country who have been left behind by the sort of you know the sort of uh, economic model that we have, those people have a lot more in common, um, despite the efforts of powers that be to, to keep them segmented and apart based on on race. Um, and and I think that's you know one thing that I think we could end as both a promise and, and a warning is you have to listen to other people's stories and and you know they have to listen to yours as well. Um, you know, I think that's the the power of of story. Yeah, that's oh, I love that. Um, so I think on that on that sort of, I think I don't know if it's hopeful. Is it a hopeful note or is it a a warning note? Um, I I like to think of it as as hopeful because um, you know otherwise it's hard to keep going. So we choose to feel to feel hopeful. Um, you know, I think it is it is possible, but it's a uh, you know to quote the um, sort of the, the Buddhist saying, right? Once you're faced faced in the right direction, all you need to do is take one step, and then you're on your way. Um, and so we all need to do that. And and you know, for us in the academy, we need to figure out how are we going to 
um, empower our students to be hypercritical citizens. Hmm. Um, that is our most important thing. You know, if my students learn about all these different religious traditions and they know what samsara is and they know what karma is and they, you know, they know different, like what I call kind of the trivia, the dinner party, impress your, your, your date kind of trivia stuff. That, that's great. But I, I want them to get used to asking, to learn how to ask critical questions of every single thing that they are ever exposed to. Whether it's, you know, some random uncle at Thanksgiving dinner who says something or whether it's a news story or whether it's a TikTok video or whether it's on whatever social media platform they're on. That's the single most important thing that for us in the academy that I think that we can do. Um, I mean, we can play with our ideas and that's, that's fine. Um, but, but ultimately we need to contribute to the community around us. And so that's my, for me, that's, that's my focus. And so I'd ask everyone listening to think about um, what are you doing to put yourself uh, on that right direction? It takes a million different forms. There's no one way to, to do it. Um, you know, I personally don't like going out and being with large groups of people. I think it's the whole zombie thing. I think these people could all decide to eat me. <laughs> um, right. So I, I, that's not my, not my way. Um, but that's part of why I do what I do in working with, especially young people who tend to be more, more flexible in so many different ways than, um, us older folks. And, uh, that's, you know, my, um, to use another term, that's my dharma. That's, um, that's my, my path. So I ask everyone to consider what their, what their path looks like and to just take one more step along it. Mm-hmm. Well, that was definitely hopeful and lovely. And I think a lovely, a lovely note to end on because we are out of time and I do want to be yes. respectful to everybody's time. So Dr. De Silva, thank you so much um, for being willing to uh, hang out and talk for an hour and a half on a Friday night about religious diversity and the history and and hopefully the future, hopefully a future where we do listen to each other's stories. And Yeah, and, and I'll put together, we'll work together to put together some um, a good list of resources um, with some links to stuff that's online, as well as stuff that is, is in print. And, um, you know, so if people track back and, and look up the recording, um, you know, we'll find a way to distribute. But there's so much literature that's out there, um, you know, it, it's it's a wonderful time to be in, in terms of access to, to information. So. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So we'll put, um, we'll put links to everything that uh, Dr. De Silva mentioned in his talk in the, in the discussion tonight. We'll, we'll add those links to the show notes here in the next week or so. Um, I always say week or so to give myself a little grace room. <laughs> uh, so thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we really enjoyed it. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed it and it gave you something to think about. Um, really quickly before we sign off, uh, I want to invite everybody to next month's Philosophy in the City event, which um, in line with Dr. De Silva's closing remarks will be uh, education, theory and policy. So we will be looking at some of the large scale educational policies uh, in the United States and the theories behind them. Um, how we should look at educational leadership, how we should look at curriculums in public schools, um, and all sorts of good stuff. So please think about joining us next month. And thank you so much for hanging out with us this evening. Bye. Bye. Okay, Okay, cool. I was like, I don't know when she's gonna turn it <laughs> Is it a hot mic or is it or is it okay? <laughs> right.